Welcome to the Small Town Podcast. I'm Sarah Roach Lewis. And today I'm actually going to be talking to you a little bit about mitigating the storm that can happen in your not for profit, some tips and tricks. So, a little bit about myself. I was um, invited to join the board of directors for Women's Network PEI so long ago that I was recruited for the Youth Voice. And I tell you, that is not a voice I hold any longer. I have a long history with that particular not-for-profit organization starting on the board. I was the board chair, then transitioned to paid employment, uh, moving through a project coordinator, project manager, and then I spent some time as the executive director. So I do like to say that I've worn all the hats in that particular organization. Over the years, I've worked for many not-for-profits, volunteered. I've done strategic planning for a variety of uh, not-for-profit organizations, both within the province and nationally. So suffice it to say, I do think a lot about what it takes to run a successful not-for-profit organization. The not-for-profit organizations that I'm going to speak to today are are the small ones. Um, you are the arts administrators of small organizations where you may have uh, just a couple of staff. Sometimes during the year, you might be the only person on staff. Um, and so I really just want to talk to you a little bit today about what are some key things things that you can do to mitigate the storm. Um, So I'm going to start with take care of yourself. So it's so easy to say that the reality of the situation is running a small not-for-profit is very similar to running a small business. And there is always way too much to do. And usually too few people to do it. So uh, an executive director is generally the person who is spinning plates or keeping all the balls in the air. So where does taking care of yourself fit into this when your life is likely very busy and you often feel as though when, if you stop for a minute, all those plates that you're spinning are going to fall to the ground or you're, you're, you're juggling these balls and one of them is going to fall and what does that look like? The reality is the most important thing that you can do for both you and your organization is to take care of yourself. And we have a saying where you can't pour from an empty cup. So what does this look like in a practical sense? Well, there's things that you can do to take care of yourself that stem from your organization. So having a conversation with your board about the kind of outcomes that you're or that are important to your organization. So we often, although I feel that it's changing, particularly in the not-for-profit or the community sector, we have this cult of presenteeism. This idea that in order for us to be successful, in order for our organizations to do all of the things that they need to do, we need to be at our desk or in our office from 8 until 4 or 9 until 5 or whatever the hours may be. And so depending on your organization, absolutely, you may need to have someone in the office during those during business hours. What I want you to think about is what does the outcomes of your organization look like, given that you are always going to have more work to do, really, than you have time to accomplish? So one of the things that I feel is really important is having those conversations with your board around moving to a results-based outcome model. So rather than it being important that you are in your off in your at your desk from this time to this time what are the results that we want to achieve within our organization now our board is going to give us uh, some of that strategic direction the other place where we're going to find that kind of direction is with our funders as well and the funding agreements that you have so that's one of the things is if you're looking after yourself 
Let's be really clear about what are the goals that you are trying to achieve, what are the outcomes you're trying to achieve for your organization. The next thing I would suggest is to find a work style that works for you. So I always said when I worked for a not-for-profit that my job is flexible except when it's not. So much of my work, I was very lucky, could be done with a cell phone and a laptop. And there were those times when there was a funding announcement or a minister's office called and asked for a meeting or your funding um, partner wants you to have a meeting. In those times, it kind of doesn't, in my experience, for me, kind of didn't matter if my kid was sick. Uh, It kind of didn't matter what else was happening for those times when my job was flexible except when it wasn't except when it wasn't i i did the things that i needed to do in order to make sure that my organization was well looked after the flip side to that is it was flexible except when it's not so what does flexibility look like for me it was flexibility and autonomy so I live in the country, and my my commute to the office was 45 minutes a day. And one of the things that I looked at was, would I be able to work at home a day or two a week? What would that do for me? So in terms of taking care of myself, I was able to save an hour. Any day that I was able to work at home was an hour and a half savings. So I was able to look at that and say, I'm going to spend an extra hour and a half working on my business or on my organization today. I have a proposal that needs to be done. So I'm going to use that hour and a half that I've saved driving to work on a proposal. Or I'm going to do laundry. I'm going to use that hour and a half to make my personal life better. So for me, it was looking at are there ways where I could make the work work for me in a way that is taking care of myself? That was one that was important to me. The other one is around um, recognizing the cadence of the work and building in the downtime. So we often have in our organizations, we may have events, we may have festivals, we may have big projects or programs that take up a lot of our time. And the reality is, like, that's just the reality of the situation. We can fight that or we cannot. Sometimes work gets in the way of life, and sometimes life gets in the way of work. What I want to encourage you to do in terms of really thinking about how do you take care of yourself is it's really easy to keep the insane pace even after the insanity is over. So an example I would use for that is a number of years ago, um, I was part of a coordinating of um, a major national project. Um, We had a national conference. We published a book. It was um, a bit of a... Insanity was a good definition of that. After that was over, that was over the end of September, and it wasn't until November that I realized I was still going at this crazy pace. I couldn't get myself to slow down. And so in my circumstance, what I actually did was went and looked at my WestJet dollars and figured out how far can I go for the least amount of money. So my husband and I went to Alberta in December and had a great visit with some family and friends. And I really needed in that moment to actually get out of the province in order to, I needed to really separate myself from the work in order to calm myself back down. Um, So we don't always, you know, we can't always afford to to hop on a plane. Um, But I do want to encourage you to, on the one hand, you know, of course, there are times when life is going to get busy, when our work is going to get busy, and to not beat ourselves up over that. And at the same time, to really be intentional and purposeful about slowing down when you can. Because there's always, I mean, we live on PEI, there's always a cadence to the work. There's always a seasonality to it. 
So the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about that is um, practicing your own self care. So looking after yourself, there's some of those things that we can we can kind of look at in terms of our work. And then there's practicing your own self-care. So whatever that looks like for you. And again, I, as um, a super busy executive director many years ago, um, this was suggested to me and I thought they were loony. I don't have time for that. I don't have time. You know, I, how do I, how do I build this in? What I would say is that it is really important. Um, whether it is getting a massage, going for a walk, or having a guided meditation. I really want you to spend the time listening to my interview with Louise Carota um, as part of this podcast, because that's what she talks about. And even if it's something just really as simple as finding your own breath. Uh, A number of years ago, I went to a national conference. And one of the things that happens as people who attend national conferences on behalf of Prince Edward Island, is we often end up feeling like the poor cousin, that there are these um, national arts organizations or these national organizations that have budgets that are exponentially bigger than ours and have far more staff and, you know, really just looks amazing. So, this was in 2012 that I went to this particular conference and... One of the things that I heard over and over and over again, it was actually a conference um, about working in in, um, improving poverty, Uh, so organizations that were doing community economic development. One of the things that I kept hearing in all of the small and large group conversations was this idea that people were feeling really disconnected. They're feeling really disconnected from their community, and, and in particular from their environment. And I had this amazing moment of, huh, so, our, and a real f- shift of feeling like the poor cousin to feeling so incredibly blessed that I live on Prince Edward Island. It had been a bumper chanterelle season. And so my dad and my kids had spent every waking moment in the woods in September picking mushrooms and my kids were climbing trees and I was having a great time with them. And I think we are really lucky that we have the ability um in this province to be in to be in nature pretty quickly and if the only thing that you do in terms of practicing self-care is to go outside it is really critical and important so the next thing that i want to uh, talk about in terms of looking after yourself is is remembering that your actions actually set the culture in your organization and 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 that that culture is really important people look to you and as the leader in an organization they pay far more attention to what you do than what you say so for example i have become an early morning person i have not always been but i am now and so i in times where i'm busy in times where there's a lot on the go, I would get up at four or five in the morning and just start working. And part of that working is firing off emails. And what I realized is that that put a pressure on my, on our staff, on our, cl- you know, on, on board members that they felt that they needed to be Johnny on the spot, in particular with our staff, that they needed to be able to respond to these emails that I would send at four or five or six in the morning. The reality is, I would say, don't look at those. You don't need to say, I'm just up and I'm doing that. I don't have any expectation that you're doing that. The re- and what happens is it puts... I'm, I was setting the culture by my actions and not by my words. They didn't necessarily see that I might start at four or five or six in the morning, but I'm done 
by one or two or three in the afternoon. They might not see that I start super early. And part of the reason why I do that is because I need to take one of my kids to the dentist or the doctor in the afternoon. So I really loved that having that flexibility and autonomy. And I also needed to recognize that it was impacting other people. So I'll talk a little bit more about how we can kind of work around that. The other thing about um, looking after ourselves as we sort of live through or mitigate storms is if you've got a team, leverage it. Doesn't matter if it's a big team or a little team. One of the things that I actually really hate is errands. When I go to work, I like to go to work. I like to sit at my desk and I like to stay in my office until the day is over and then I like to go home. And yet, there's always the things that you need to do in the run of a day. In a staff meeting one time, what I discovered is one of my staff members loves running errands. And to her, that was a natural break that she needed in the day. And it, it, it did all kinds of good things for her. It was exactly what she needed. So we had this great ability then for me not to feel badly because I was asking her to run errands. I was actually doing her a favor and she was doing me a favor. So think about those ways that you can leverage your team. I am 100% all about high performance. People who lead organizations do it because they are passionate, they're dedicated, and they're ambitious. Um, One of the people that I had the pleasure of talking to in this podcast series was Rob Oakey from Music PEI. Uh, Rob obviously has a vision for his organization and and an ambition to bring local artists internationally. That organization has increased um, the number of touring artists by 500% on PEI. That doesn't happen without punching above your weight. So I I believe that as um, arts organizations or as not-for-profits, we're doing this work because we're passionate about it, because we are ambitious and we want to see big things for our community, and for our particular constituents. And key and critical to being a high performer is taking care of yourself. Um, And so if you happen to be on a board and you're listening to this and you have um, in the the past been pretty pleased with yourself because you've got this executive director or this, you know, key member of your management team, who goes above and beyond and does all of the work and is incredibly responsive and, um, you know, probably does exponentially more work than they get paid for. I want to be very clear that that is not something to be proud of. Your role as a board chair is to make sure that your staff are doing their job. And part of your role is to make sure that they are not overdoing things. Um, It is a huge risk to your organization to have staff who are not looking after themselves and are approaching burnout. So again, depending on your governance structure, as a board, um, you know, you may not dig too far into operations, which is totally fine. You can still be careful and ensuring that your executive director and um, is, is making sure that um, staff are not approaching burnout, including themselves. So... And I really think, I, I, I look at that as it is not altruistic. It is a huge risk to your organization um, if your leadership is not taking, is, is, uh, has a potential for burnout. And it is one of the things that funders look at. I had an interesting conversation with a funder a number of years ago, and one of the things that they consider when they are looking at a funding proposal is what does the leadership look like and has there been any major transitions in the leadership team over the next last X number of years? So 
mitigating the storm, number one, take care of yourself. Number two, good planning. So the storms can come in all kinds of um, in all kinds of ways, right? So you know, a storm often is financial. It could be a board upheaval. It could be a program disruption. It could be something related to your staffing, or it could be reputational. There's lots of other things. Uh, I think for me. Good planning is really important. The financial health of your organization should always be your top priority. There are other things, but at the end of the day, ca- um, you know, cash is king, and you need to make sure that your organization is financially healthy. How do you do that? Is you make sure that you are um, doing kind of the planning, and you always know where you're at. There's a difference between what that looks like for a project-based organization and, a, and an organization that's got a little bit of core or operational funding. So that good planning can look like ensuring that you've got diversified revenue streams, if at all possible. So making sure that uh, some of your a portion of your revenues are coming from the federal, the provincial government. Um, perhaps you can get a little pots um, from the municipalities. There's uh, sometimes grants. Whether or not you have charitable funding or charitable status or not is going to impact your ability to get fa- foundation money. And then there's also um, donations and how do you, you know, how do you diversify that within fundraising or donors to your organization? So the planning is what's going to help you allocate your resources properly. Um, and, and again, one of the things that we know about good planning is that we can have cost savings if we're doing things um, uh, in, in plenty of time, um, doing things last minute, recognizing that, oh dear, I need this, you know, thing for my event that's tonight, that's going to cost you more money in general than if you've planned ahead. So what does that look like? What does good planning look like? Well, part of it is thinking through some of the other areas that we've talked about on this podcast. It's making sure that you really do have a good sense of the vision and the mission for your organization. That Each of your projects that you're working on in your organization has a solid project plan that has a communication strategy attached to it. As someone who worked in a project-based not-for-profit for for many years, I have a mixed relationship with strategic planning because sometimes... um, you know, at the end of the day, you, it, it's helpful to have a strategic vision for your organization. But the plan itself um, sometimes is really defined by your funder, is defined by the work that you have to do in front of you. Um, and, you know, so, so part of that is making sure that you don't end up with mission drift or mandate drift. But at the end of the day, you need some sort of overarching plan, and that's going to help um, help mitigate these times where things are not necessarily going as as well for your for your organization. And the, again, I'm going to circle back to the to the you. Be kind and gentle with yourself. Sometimes, despite all of your best efforts, your experience um, you experience an ebb or in your organization. And, you know, many, some of you may be starting organizations that are relatively new. Others are shepherding old organizations that have been around for a long time through changing times. And again, if I go back to my own experience of seeing the storm coming at me and doing everything that I could to manage that. And at the end of the day, sometimes, despite your best efforts, <laughs> things go to hell. So in 2014, at Women's Network, I was the executive director and we had a banner year. Um, the best year in terms of revenues, in terms of projects that we had had really in um, the organization's history. And it was really Hamper. I, I, it was wonderful, and because we're a project-based organization, we could see the end in sight. 
We could see the end of projects, and this project was wrapping up, and that project was wrapping up, and that project was wrapping up. And so it was a very difficult time of writing proposal after proposal, um, trying to hustle as much as we absolutely could, and rec- recognizing that um, there we were going to need to lay off staff. We were going to need to wrap up programs that were beloved in our community, but we just simply didn't have um, the funding to do them. And so as much as that was a very difficult time, the planning that we did allowed us to mitigate it as best as possible. So what I mean by that is we had a tiny nest egg, and I mean a a pretty tiny nest egg, um, which we worked hard to which we worked hard to kind of pull into our unrestricted funds over the years. But what that did was allow the board to make the decision that they would hire, that I would stay on for part-time, for 20 hours a week. And even though there were no projects, my job was to continue to look for funding, was to kind of continue to do those core operations as we uh, figured out what the next steps were. And we knew that there was some funding coming through the door. From a personal side, it was not necessarily fun knowing that, uh, you know, staff were going to need to be laid off. However, Because we could see that coming, because we had done good planning, we were able to, it was not a surprise to anyone, and including me. I was able to then go and look for side hustles or different contracts that I could, um, that I could find that would, um, that would amplify the 20 hours a week that I already had. So the next thing that I would say around mitigating the storm is about good relationships, whether that's, um, and, and it's so important, I think, in everywhere in the world, I think it's really good, important to have good relationships. There's something specific out about PEI, um, you know, our, our size, how small we are, and the person that, uh, you know, you're having a conversation with in a meeting could be the person who lands at breakfast um, on Sunday morning with your family because someone just invites them along. So uh, really thinking about as someone who's who's leading an organization, there are a lot of relationships that you have to make manage. Um, Obviously, having a good relationship with your board is really important, your staff, your funders, your donors, your community. And part of those is always holding yourself to a high ethical standard, always remembering your organization's mission, vision, and mandate. What is it that you're doing? Um, What is it that you are... um, what is it that you're trying to do with your organization? Those relationships that you build along the way are going to help you regardless of what the storm is. When people know, so again, another example is many, many years ago, um, an organization that I was working with lost all of their, they, they just had uh, no funding. Um, and again, lost all of their staff. There was There were lots of problems. And their one of their key funders really wanted to see this organization continue to thrive. And so they actually helped the organization come up with a, with a project that they could fund that really, at the, at the end of the day, allowed the organization to rebuild. And that, was a, and that happened because the leadership of that organization worked really hard to have good relationships with, in that case, their funders. So the last thing that I want to talk through with you are, I just want to go super tactical. So the reality is, um, you know, if we're trying to manage all of the balls that are in the air, if we're trying to make sure that we have enough time to get everything done, even though that in and of itself is, we know is, is a pretty huge challenge. What I want to do is actually give you some really tactical tips and tricks for that. Since I left um, my work uh, in a not-for-profit, I do a lot of work now, both with um, both with the community sector and with the business sector. And all along my career, 
One of the things I've always tried to figure out is how to be efficient, how to be productive, because there's so many things that I want to do. There's so many ways that we need to change the world. So I'm going to walk through a couple of them with you right now. The first one is, if you've got a team, a daily stand-up. And so a daily stand-up is a short meeting that everyone stands because you talk a lot less when you're standing. So it's really a matter of hopping, getting your team together and what you talk about are, um, you know, what are three things you did yesterday, three things you're working on today, and is there anything that you're stuck on or you need help with? Super, it doesn't matter if you've got a team of two or a team of 15, you can still do this in less than 10 minutes. Um, and it's a really great way of keeping people accountable, um, seeing where people are struggling, building in good communications. And what I also love about this is uh, it can happen regardless of whether people are working remotely or not. Um, We all have uh, phones that we can phone in and just, you know, put popper on on speakerphone. So that's the first thing, daily stand-up. The next thing is leverage your technology. Um, you know, the world is full of tools now to make us efficient. Um, and if we think about things like if we're working with a team, having a shared drive uh, like a Google Drive or Dropbox, um, we live in a province where winters can be long and very difficult. Meetings can be held now um, on Zoom. Uh, there's lots of online meeting spaces. The one that I use is called Zoom. And even when you have really bad rural internet, which I used to have, uh, Zoom still tends to work pretty well. So again, um, if we are really busy, uh, there's tra- there's always travel time. Um, and Or if we want to avoid things like snowstorms in the wintertime, uh, planning to have Zoom meetings will, will mitigate some of that The other thing I like to do is use calendar links. Uh, So just in terms of being productive and uh, using your time wisely, just sending out a link to your calendar. Um, Again, there's lots of them. The one that I use is called Calendly. And if you send a link to your calendar, then you can just say to the person that you're trying to meet meet with, um, you know, here's here are all of my available options. You just choose one that works for you. We can use doodle polls for planning meetings. There's all kinds of ways, um, you know, there's all kinds of project management tools that we can use if we're doing a lot of teamwork. I also really encourage you to track your time. Um, particularly, we always say, you know, we're all, we're all busy. At the end of the day, we're all busy. I'm going to challenge you that you are probably not quite as busy as you think you are. And I'm going to say that because I've done this challenge myself a number of times. So it's, um, I, I will include a link to a, to a easy Excel spreadsheet, um, in this, as part of this podcast. But essentially, you do Sunday to Sunday and you can decide. I like to track in 15 minute in- increments and I really suggest people do it for a week or two. You, um, and I'll, I'll tell you that for myself, I thought that I was crazy busy and I thought that I worked 60 hours a week. And when I did this the first time, I worked 45 hours a week. So, That's more than 40, but it is certainly not 60. And so I think tracking your time is going to then help you with the next um, recommendation or tactic that I, I suggest for you. And that is we all have 90 minutes a day that we are at our peak optimal performance. I want you to find that and then fiercely protect it. That is where you should be doing your most important work, whether it's your proposal writing or your grant writing or your program development or whatever that like really important work is to your organization. That's once you track your time, um, you'll start to see. So for me, it's early in the morning. Other people, uh, you know, their best time of day is in the afternoon. Other people, it's in the evening. So find your best 90 minutes and fiercely protect it. Don't have meetings. Just use that for the kind of work that is most important for you to do. 
The next suggestion that I have for you is to plan your day the day before. There's this great quote that either you you run your day or your day runs you. And again, I know that uh, in a in a small and busy not for profit, uh, we can very easily get distracted by the phone, or we can get distracted by email, or we can get distracted by someone popping into the office. And at the end of the day, if you plan your day the day before, so. Again, um, at the end of your day, what I tend to do is I'll just write down, you know, sort of the three or four key things that I got, uh, that I did. And then what are the three key things that I would like to do the next day? So what that does is it allows me, it, it prevents decision fatigue. I don't even have to think when I get to um, the office or, you know, in some cases that's my couch um, or my home office or I I work in Charlottetown some days. On those days, I don't have to think about what I'm doing. I just open um, my agenda and I have already told, (laughs) past Sarah has told future Sarah what she's doing that day. So that prevents the decision fatigue of having to figure it out. The other thing, too, is there are certain things that you can do to grease the wheel, Um, particularly if what you have to do is something you don't really feel like doing. So, for example, if I know that I need to work on finances, then um, the night before I may open all of the tabs on my computer that I need. So it's all right there. The next tactic I would suggest for um, being efficient, which is going to, you know, kind of help you um, manage your days, is um, is what I call the 4515. And so what I mean by this is we often work in co-work spaces or we work in environments where there's shared space. And the challenge with that, particularly if we're working in a creative in, uh, in a creative space, is, you know, sometimes people um, need to talk in order to get their work done. And sometimes that can be excessively distracting. So one strategy that I have used in a number of places where I've worked is that if you just look at the calendar, or if you look at the clock, the first 45 minutes of every hour is for dedicated work. And the last 15 minutes of the hour is for when I need to ask one of my colleagues a question, or I want to, you know, kind of pop in and and brainstorm an idea, or I want to find out if this date works best on their calendar. The reality is most of us do not work in life and death situations where a question can't wait 45 minutes at its max to be answered. I find that this is beautiful when it works, and I also find it is generally the leaders in the organizations who ignore it. Often you staff are really craving some sort of structure to their day and some ability to be creative and have those conversations that they really need to move their work forward and the quiet, um, focused time that they need to actually get the work done. So again, um, the next thing that I would say is plan your day, uh, no, sorry, um, is theme days. So When we are feeling overwhelmed, when we feel like we've got a lot of things that we need to do, one of the ways that we can kind of plan around that is to chunk up our time. So um, we may decide that we've got finance Fridays. So we do all of the finances on Fridays and maybe your external bookkeeper comes in on Friday mornings. So what happens with that is, you know, when the mail comes, you don't have to look at any of those bills until Friday because that's the thing that you do on Fridays. Perhaps you want to do your program development on one particular day. Perhaps you need to do all of your reporting. That seems to kind of naturally coincide with um, finances for me. So I might look at doing finances. Um, I might look at doing reporting at the same time that I'm working on finances. So think about ways that you can theme your days. Think about ways that you can batch your work. Um, And those are some of the things that you can do in terms of like super tactical The last thing that I would say is to celebrate your wins. It, and those are the big wins and the little wins. Um, one thing that I just started doing and I really love it is to have a mason jar on my desk. And when I have a win or a success in my, 
in my business, I write it down and put it in the jar. And at the end of the month, I pull them out. And sometimes I've even forgotten what those wins were. So I think it's really important when we are often really working to solve big challenges, when we are working to, you know, promote the music industry, or we're looking to, you know, ensure that um, artists are what whatever the the mandate of your organization is it's generally something that's much bigger than you and so it's really easy to kind of get bogged down in in um all of the challenges that we face when we are under resourced and overworked so what i do encourage you to do is is to celebrate that so whether you've got the you've got the the jar with your little wins look for the excuses to celebrate whether it's uh staff birthdays or anniversaries or, uh, you know, Groundhog Day, I don't care what it is, just find. And it doesn't need to be a huge celebration. It's just something that we can do to celebrate the wins. When there are bigger things, absolutely celebrate those. Is it your, your, your organization's um, anniversary? Maybe you've been around for five years. Maybe you've been around for 15 years. Take the time to, to celebrate those sorts of things. It really is um, affirming for both you, your staff, your board, and your membership. And finally, I just wanted to end by saying um, that I was I was thinking about this whole idea about mitigating the storm. And, and to some degree, there is that quote about, life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass, it's about learning to dance in the rain. So I hope that I've given you some tips and tricks for mitigating uh, the storm, but also just a recognition that it's going to happen. There are always ebbs and flows. Figure out how to dance in the rain and have a good time while you're doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you.